You all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. The fight for the environment. Climate change is at the forefront here at the United Nations. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The perils of climate change are dominating this year's United Nations General Assembly in New York. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has hosted a special climate summit and young people from around the world are here to make their voices heard. Well, joining me now is Carolina Schmidt. She is the Environment Minister of Chile and the President-designate of COP25, which is a climate conference which is going to be held in Chile, in Santiago, uh, at the end of this year. Minister, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to you. Lots of discussions here in New York on climate change. Do you think the message is getting through? I think the people is making the message getting through. It's people who is feeling in their daily lives the impact of climate change all over the world, who is raising the voice for making leaders to act. And we are here now because of the people and we have a responsibility really to hear that voice and act. Do you get the sense that leaders around the world recognize that uh, this is an urgent challenge that humanity faces? Leaders around, around the world hear people. We are now facing a crisis in our nature, a climate crisis. And this really requires urgent action. We have been talking a lot. Since 1992, leaders of the world have been joined in order to discuss the actions and necessary changes we must do in order to face climate change. Now we are facing a crisis, so the urgency of action comes in a very important way. So time for negotiation has finished, time for action has started. COP25 will be the first COP before implementing the Paris Agreement. This very important agreement that all the countries in the world realize they have to do changes in order to face climate change must now be taken into action and that is the important role of the COP25. So you'll have something like 197 countries and partners in this uh, taking part in that conference. What do you hope to achieve? We hope to achieve a changing of the way things have been doing. Now we need to implement the Paris Agreement. And we know because the science has spoken so loud and so clear that what the countries committed in, under the Paris Agreement is not enough. We need to update our commitments with much more ambitions. So what we need for uh, COP25 is ambition, is implementation, and is concrete action that people can see that we, leaders of the world, are really here at them and fronting this crisis. Uh, there is a perception in the world that climate change and the impact that it's going to have on us is something that's going to happen in the future, but the impact is actually taking place right now, isn't it? I think that people is understanding that much better than most of the leaders sometimes. We are facing the heat uh, whales, you know, all over the country. We have seen now forests burning in places where never, you know, before. It's not only the Amazon, as it's always we can see in places like where very, you know, strange places to have this uh, forest uh, burning now in massive, in a massive way. We are facing and see how the level of the sea is increasing and floodings are coming and people in the Iceland and in coastal are suffering from the effects of climate change. Everybody in every single place of the world. It's not something that the ice are melting in the poles. Now we are all feeling the effects of climate change. And children and young people are scared about the future. So this must be an urgent call for people and for leaders to act. And then I, let me tell you one main difference that we want uh, to make. Always we have seen that, you know, that the leaders of the governments, of the central governments are the one uh, that they need to move. And this is true and important. But we also know now that if we really might want to make the difference, we also have to include the leaders of the uh, pri private sector. It's impossible to think we're going to really make big change if we don't bring them to the table, if we don't bring also the leaders of the local governments. And with one thing very in mind, that's 
follow the science. In this summit, we are united behind the science. It's, we have now, you know, very clear where we have to move. So now it's time for action and decisions. You know, we have seen the impacts of climate change in some places. We see storms. We see, well, we've just seen the hurricanes here in the United States as well. But you have a special focus on the health of our oceans. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, COP25 is uh, recognized internationally already as the Blue Cop. That's why I'm blue. No, it's a Blue Cop because we want to pay, make a special focus on, on oceans. Oceans are being receiving, you know, the impact of climate change in a very strong way. And we know that without blue, there's no green. Without green, there's no life. And before, nobody attempted to really include the ocean in the discussion for action into the climate change. This is why we want this theme to be central, not only in the work and analysis that we do during COP25, but on the results and solution for climate change, including oceans in the NDCs of the country, which are the commitment for action and change for all the country. This is a crucial uh, thing because ocean is not, so, not only suffering from climate change, but also ocean is part of the solution for climate change. Ocean is one of the big things of you know, greenhouse gases. If we don't really work on protecting our ocean and have a development that is sustainable of the ocean, we will not be able to keep that sinking that is key in order to keep our planet safe. Uh, how would you assess the progress that's been made since the Paris Accords were signed? Well, no, I think we have made a very big and important, you know, uh, issue and, and, and in, in, in during the Paris Agreement that makes all the countries responsible to facing climate change. Before that was this big discussion that was the developed country who has been responsible of most of the emission who had to take care. In the Paris Agreement that was a big change, he say no. All the countries must do something and want to address climate change. And we signed an agreement in, in Paris and every single country has their own um, contribution you know, for, for the climate change. But the science has spoken and the IPCC report 1.5 show us that all the different contributions of the countries are not enough to accomplish the goal of the Paris Agreement, which was to keep the 1.6 maximum in increase of temperature. So what takes now is under the Paris Agreement to update our contribution, our national determined contribution, our NDCs, in order to really accomplish the goal of the Paris Agreement. That is why in COP25, that is the first COP before the implementation of the Paris Agreement and before the country have to update their NDC during 2020, we want to come with concrete actions and commitments. And we are on the right phase because in this summit of the Secretary General, we launched an alliance for uh, the ambition and we have seen a response that was unbelievable just three months ago in the commitment of country, country for carbon neutrality for 2050, how the science is requesting with urgency to the different countries. So we want this to continue for COP25. In your view, is that a realistic goal, uh, carbon zero by 2050? It's an urgent goal. Carbon neutrality for 2050 is not only necessary, it is possible and it's happening right now. We have the 66 countries already committed to the carbon neutrality. This is one of the uh, third of all the countries of uh, the uh, conference of the part. But most important of all, carbon neutrality brings social and economic benefits for the people. We must put the people in, in the front of all our decision. And if we do that, we will go for the carbon neutrality in 2030. You know, you mentioned you want to get all countries on board. And I'm wondering how much of a challenge is it uh, when you have countries that are actually questioning the science, that are skeptical of the science? Here in the United States, President Trump says climate change is a hoax. It's a big challenge what we have uh, an, a front. But, you know, this political situation, that is a difficult political situation, also has a counterpart. That is, for the first time, we're seeing people raising the voice all over the world. So, yes, we have some few, very few skeptics. They are powerful, but they are few. And we have many, 
many millions of people who now believe and demand action to their leaders. And so the leader, if the leaders do not act, we will see that people will make them act. And when I'm talking leaders, I'm talking not only for central governments of the countries. I'm also talking about, you know, leaders in the local governments. I'm talking leaders in the private sectors, in the NGOs, in the companies around the world. We are seeing those leaders acting. We came to New York to look for leadership, to look for that vision of future and, and be able to act for the people. And we found this leadership. We found this 66 country that's already are making the commitment for the carbon neutrality in 2050, but also we found the leaders of the private sector, more than 100 companies, commitment for carbon neutrality before 2050. We found the investor that only want to invest in countries who have carbon neutrality for 2050. So we are, you know, starting to move the way towards the carbon neutrality. In fact, uh, we know, we've been talking to people here at the United Nations, where mayors of cities have taken the initiative. They've, in fact, bypassed their national governments. Are you seeing a lot of that? A lot of that. In our Alliance for Ambition, we got already more than 100 cities and more than 10 regions in the world already committed for the carbon neutrality before 2050. And we're seeing big regions and, you know, important leaders of the world making the change. Even if the national leaders are not with them, they are making the change. And you know why? Because they are more close to the territory. And when you're more close to the territory, you can feel what the people need. I want to talk about your country, Chile. You've been at the forefront uh, in the battle against climate change. Uh, you are leading the way in trying to produce renewable energy. You've banned plastic bags. You've got an electric fleet, which is the biggest after China, actually. Uh, what can you tell us about Chile's experience? Well, Chile is a country that is at the end of the world. It's a small country. We are 17 million uh, people. It's a country who suffered the climate change in a very strong way. We have seven uh, of the nine conditions for vulnerability uh, in climate change. So our people know what is, you know, facing and we're living now this situation. And when others tend to uh, say that, you know, the science is not already being clear enough, Chile was able to raise the voice, you know, to the world. That is only one way to create development, economic growth and bring prosperity to the people. And that is taking care of our planet and that is with climate action. So with that message, we came here to the center of the world in New York to lead the country to take decision for the benefit of the people, for economic growth and pro prosperity, you need to take care of climate change. And we are listening and this growing message, giving it to the people, we are listening, the leaders of the world that are reacting to that. Thanks, Minister. After the break, we will discuss the challenges cities are facing around the world due to climate change. I will talk with the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen. Stay with us. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week, we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists, and others. It's a fresh, focused, and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict, or US politics, the Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find the Heat podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search the Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.